But let's get on to the main issue of the week. And that is the issue of how we relate to people who could take a COVID-19 vaccine, but have refused to do so. Lots of people have had lots to say on both sides of this issue, and it has become a gap, a huge gap, between those who want to preserve their personal sovereignty, which I think is a real thing, and you can't discount the fact that some people don't like to be told what vaccines to take. But then there are those like the majority of Canadians, 90% practically, who are willing to give up some of that personal choice for what they see as the greater good. Now, the media has been in the thick of this thing, of course, and certainly the things that started rolling out in Ottawa a week ago with the so-called truckers protest is kind of um, the cherry on top of a lot of stuff that's been going on. We'll have more to say about that in a bit. Um, And as we've seen... Even the commentary from the media has turned into something that's very divisive, particularly in the situation where you get somebody posts a column on one of the major newspaper sites, and then people comment. And wow, those comments get pretty hot and heavy, as we will see and hear in just a couple of minutes. For example, give a listen to Gary Mason from the Globe and Mail. This is how he was handling this. There's going to be a segment of the unvaxxed, you know, the people that are showing up in front of uh, politicians' homes at all hours of the day with with picket signs and, and, you know, talking about, you know, Nuremberg trials and sending threatening notes to journalists. You know, you know they're, they're going to die. They, they'll die before they have a vaccine put in their body. I, I'd say, you know, we're never going to convince them. But, you know, there are others that we can still reach. But it's not going to be through nice talk and gentle persuasion and let's, you know, get them into therapy. I mean, we don't have the time to do that. Like a pandemic affects all of us. It affects all society. It's not like we're not talking about smokers or somebody who drinks too much. I mean, those comparisons are absolutely silly to make them. This is a once in 100 years pandemic. It takes, you know, and it it necessitates extraordinary measures. This is extraordinary times. And people have to get that through their heads. So, yes, these are truly extraordinary times. And, of course, one of the big things about um, you know, this debate about the unvaccinated, the statistics, although some people try and cook up or find statistics to uh, contradict this, the statistics say, okay, let's give or take 90% of Canadians are fully vaccinated, okay? 10% aren't. But the 10% who aren't make up 90% of the people who are in intensive care and probably a similar uh, amount in acute care. So, you know, when you've got that situation and when you have the number of people that we have in our intensive care units and in acute care and how that then turns out to ration medical care for other people who had no choice about being sick, this is where some of the tension gets worked up about the unvaccinated. And it's pretty natural. But I wonder if we could have done things a different way. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, uh, Robin Sears and and Tasha Carradine. Um, This was uh, Robin's item in the Toronto Star. And look at the headline, okay? Let that one sink in. And then a couple of days later, we had uh, Tasha's first column for Post Media in the Globe and Mail. And again, you can see there's a tone there, right? Well, the National Post being um, a little to the right of centre. Okay, we'll let the guffaws die down a little bit there. But (laughs) they are what they are. And you can imagine that when Tasha tried to be calm and reasonable and balanced, although the headline writer didn't help her very much, um, the reaction she got was something. And she had to write a follow-up column that looked like this. So I think that um, what we need to do, what we need to do is really do a deeper dive into this. And and how we do that, actually, is to go to those two writers. It was the reaction to Tash's column in the National Post that really got me going on the fact that, you know, the length and breadth and depth of this of this gap that we're dealing with between ourselves and the unvaccinated is really not good. 
it is damaging, socially damaging, uh, health-wise damaging, the whole nine yards. And if you could see the email traffic that I'm getting, wow, you'd see that there's already ample evidence of this gap. And that was even before Tasha and Robin's columns, uh, you know, hit the newspapers. So I reached out to both of them. Both of them agreed to get together on Zoom and really have a closer look at what was going on, uh, what they were thinking about when they wrote those articles. Why did they write those articles? It's a little unusual, by the way, I have to say, for a politician to switch roles with journalists, for a politician to interview journalists, but that's what happened. And they agreed. I had two conditions that really, you know, favored them, to be honest with you. Both of them had the absolute freedom to criticize the government in whichever way they felt they needed to. And you will hear some of that criticism in, in what they said, and you can agree or disagree. That's up to you. And the only other thing is that if uh, during our conversation they said something that they wished they hadn't said or wished it had come out the other way, I agreed that I would go back in and edit, okay? Take out whatever the oops was and, uh, and make sure that only what they really, really intended to say made it into the interview. Well, I have to tell you, dear viewers, that uh, everything you see now is just one take. I had not one edit to make in what Tasha and Robin had to say. So let's listen to them. Did, did, did this narrative get away on us, do you think? Uh, I think it, it has. I think it's gone in directions we didn't necessarily anticipate. Um, I think it's been politicized. In the last election, I think it was already politicized. I think it's been politicized since. I think what we're seeing now um, with the uh, you know, anti-vaccination truckers protest, for example, uh, is going off in a lot of rabbit holes that we've seen in the United States. Um, I've been looking online and all sorts of videos of people who are supporting this endeavor, who are talking about conspiracy theories. We're talking about the kind of fringe elements that really I think make it impossible to have a, a reasonable discourse about what vaccination means, what it means to ending the pandemic, why it is important. Um, you know, when people get their backs up about those kinds of arguments, you, it's really hard to, to have a, a conversation about it. And I think um, that, uh, you know, right now it's, it's very heightened because we are at this point with Omicron where, you know, the game has changed. We know that even being double vaccinated and having a booster doesn't guarantee you won't get Omicron, but it does help keep you out of the hospital. And that to me is the, the overriding concern or, or, or objective. And it's kind of getting lost in the conversation of, well, does vaccination mean anything? And are we having groceries on our store shelves? And these kinds of things that, you know, um, go on sidebar issues. I think it, it's, it's very hard to, to discuss rash, rationally in this context. Well, Tasha, in your article, you said civil discourse seems to be dead. I don't think it's just on this issue. I think it's on more than that. But uh, Robin, your thoughts? Well, that's where I was going to begin, Ken. I mean, I think we have to put this in a much broader context and a much longer time frame than just the recent eruptions. Um, you know, I, I would say, I think pretty much without fear of contradiction, every government in the world has done a terrible job at communicating during the pandemic. The only exception that I would make before his fall from grace was Andrew Cuomo. Uh, at the beginning, Andrew Cuomo was candid, tough, available, uh, consistent. If he made a mistake, he explained the mistake. And he did an hour-long press conference every day where he would go through a great deal of detail about where the pandemic was. And he really effectively turned around the New York crisis. And then, of course, we know what happened to him. But you know, communication skills are not part of the test for a public health official. They must be. Um, the hardest part of being a public health official in a crisis is communication. And with the greatest respect to every single one of ours, with the exception of Bonnie Henry, um, they have not been great communicators and they have not been able to be transparent and candid. And so what happens when you're, you subject an audience to that in a time of crisis, high emotional stress, great suspicion and fear. For two years, people stop trusting you. People stop wanting to hear from you. People get angry. People do and say things that they probably wouldn't in other circumstances, including, I'm sure, some of the terrible messaging that'll come out of the truckers rally on the weekend on the hill. 
So this is part of a long continuum of failure in governments in being able to communicate on public health. And this is just the latest chapter of it, in my view. Uh, I mean, I think that one of the challenges that, that every government has failed to resolve is who's in charge. Um, politicians are in charge when they are comfortable with the news they're communicating. They blame their scientists when they're a little less comfortable. Perhaps the biggest controversy being the one last summer between Premier Kenny and his public health officials. That's not good because then you ask people who are listening, who do I believe, the scientists or the politicians? Um, I think finally, I would say on, on the vaccination question itself, Norman Deutsch, who's a, a great Canadian um, psychiatrist, wrote a very thoughtful piece in the Globe this weekend, I thought, saying, when you oversell and you overpromise and then you underdeliver, as the vaccine's protection has demonstrably begun to do, you create a huge amount of suspicion. Why should I trust anything you say? Because what you said and claimed before didn't happen. So I have a lot of sympathy with the people who are really angry right now about how they've been treated by governments and public health officials. I'm not endorsing the anti-vaxxers. I don't think that's a reasonable stance from a whole variety of points of view. But I think it's important to understand how we got here. You know, that, and I, that's part of uh, what I would, was hoping we can get into because I'm interested in what both of you, knowing what you know, and, and I think you're pretty much on the same page as to the dynamics that we've been facing, but you decided to write an article. And I'm interested to know what you were thinking about uh, when you put that article together, because when I look at, at the two headlines, you know, in the Toronto Star, the headline is, what is to be done about our vaccine delinquents? And in the uh, post media, it was, the unvaccinated must be deterred from harming others. Um, that's, do those headlines kind of reflect the intent or the tone that you intended in the article? Well, I'll speak with... first, um, and not, to, not to criticize post media, but I don't write my headlines. I uh, know. No, none of the columns do, but that is actually uh, an issue, Ken, because um, the, the headline was not completely reflective of what the piece was trying to achieve, was to say there's a middle way between demonization of the anti-vaxxers and the accommodation of the anti-vaxxers. And the idea being that, you know, as, as Robin said, a lot of people have developed suspicions for a lot of reasons, some, you know, understandable and some really that elude me. But the point is that we need to move forward on this, encourage as many people to get vaccinated as possible because science does tell us that that is the only way to keep this thing at bay yes it won't necessarily prevent you from getting disease but it will keep it at bay enough that we'll be able to handle it socially from a health perspective etc so keeping um you know the public health measures right now the vaccine mandates in place is what i was arguing for so the headline did attract a lot of attention um a lot of it negative overwhelmingly negative i wrote a second piece following up explaining what i kind of hate mail i've received um and it is it is concerning i think you know, just to touch on something else Robin said about how health officials versus politicians have been sort of, you know, the football that's been kicked back and forth. I mean, some countries deliberately, like Sweden, said the health officials are in charge. The politicians essentially washed their hands of it, at least the beginning of the pandemic. At first, people thought that was great. It didn't quite work out that way either. Um, I would say to me, the best communicator has been Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, who, you know, just canceled her own wedding this week. Um, it's probably been the most honest. And, and I think New Zealand's had very strict controls on COVID. They've had extremely low rates of COVID. I think it's 11 per million inhabitants. You know, Canada were at um, hundreds per, per, per million. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that I think is very from place to place. But I agree that that kicking back and forth has been a problem because it makes people wonder, you know, who can you trust? And I think that's what came back to me. A lot of my mail was from people who've been vaccinated and said, well, it doesn't seem to matter anymore. So what do you do with that? Mm. I, I took from uh, your, your first article and the reaction article uh, as well that uh, you were trying to find a middle ground, uh, kind of the voice of reason sort of stuck in between and you ended up, well, certainly getting shot at from one side and maybe the other, I don't know. Robin, what about you? Um, what, were you what were you trying to achieve? Did you have a, a, an audience or a particular uh, group of readers in mind? And did you have a takeaway that uh, you wanted to leave people with? 
Yeah, I think, Tasha, perhaps some slightly different starting points arrive at pretty much the same place. When governments need to use coercion to execute a public policy, that's a sign of failure. There is no other way to describe it. Governments using the power of the state to force citizens to do something they don't want to do is not something you ever want to arrive at in a democracy. And that's the basic dilemma with the so-called mandates. Um, on the other hand, I think people who have not taken the vaccine are delinquent. They're delinquent to their families, to their community, to their society. There is no excuse for not being vaccinated. And if you refuse to get vaccinated, I don't believe you should threaten people with sticking a needle in their arm involuntarily. But I think it's entirely appropriate to say you have, by your choice, removed yourself from a whole series of activities in the community, which everyone else who has been responsible is entitled to enjoy. You've decided you don't want to. That's your choice. That's your decision. But that's the consequence. So I don't have any time for Macron saying he wants to piss off all the anti-vaxxers or uh, the Quebec premier threatening to charge people if they come into a hospital unvaccinated. You know, those are, uh, those are just insulting and gratuitous kinds of steps in my view. But you do need to make it clear. Decisions have consequences. And if you decide not to be vaccinated, here are the consequences. Be aware of them. That's where I end up. So, okay, you both basically came almost to the same landing point. Obviously, the uh, results and the reaction that you had, uh, to use the term intersectionality, I think uh, comes in there because, uh, you know, the, the Toronto Star has, uh, shall we say, a more progressive readership. And Tasha, as you mentioned in your uh, follow-up article, you know, the, the post media tends to be a tad right of center. He, he says chucklingly. Um, but uh, were you really prepared after the effort that you put in, Tasha, to be kind of the voice of reason in the middle of the road? Were you prepared with what you got? Uh, no, I, I wasn't prepared to hear someone say they wanted my family's brain splattered against the wall. No, I wasn't prepared for death threats and the kind of language that was used. I, I've never, I, I've received death threats in the past when I was working in television, but never in print. And um, you know, I know other columnists and especially women, um, you know, some people accuse me of playing the woman card here, but it's honestly true that the kind of slurs that women can get uh, are not slurs that can be directed against men. And there was some of that too. So I, um, you know, I was, I was surprised. Um, I have a pretty thick skin because that's you need that in public life. But I, that's one of the reasons I wrote the follow up piece was partly to, uh, to tell people the experience a bit of catharsis too, because it was you know, not the easiest thing to deal with um, when you get that kind of response. And, and disheartening too from a public policy perspective, because you realize, you know, to some of the points we've been discussing, what an uphill battle it is to find some reasonable ground on this issue. I think the proof, Tasha, of you're not playing the woman card is that I didn't get nearly the angry reaction you did. And even if the readership of the Toronto Star is, you know, in, in a different place on the political spectrum, there are lots of things those readers get angry about and send very rude emails about to me and to others. But I think it really is the case that a woman, and particularly a woman of color, who takes a controversial view can expect to get twice or several times more angry mail and, and communication than an old white guy like me. But I think the other message or the other sad reality in all of this that we should maybe touch on briefly is just civil discourse is fading. And that has a consequence in terms of behavior subsequently, because it's insightful language. It's language intended to provoke violence, frankly. And I think one of the things that um, politicians especially, but the media to some extent, have an obligation to do is to say, speaking like that is not acceptable. Do not use that kind of language in public. Your mother would wash your mouth out. <laughs> um, it's, it's just very, very dangerous when society condones racist, sexist, Islamophobic, you name it, angry, insightful rhetoric. Um, and we have laws against it. Interesting um, reflection that I had along the way was, uh, and, and I'm always reluctant to be critical of media because media really should be a mirror that we hold up to ourselves to see who we are and, and, and what we believe in. 
Uh, some, you know, particularly in our circle, talk about doom spreading, that uh, perhaps media has uh, gone a little bit uh, overboard in, in, in how horrible everything is and how um, much at risk we are. I don't know. I don't know what your assessment would be of that. But the other player in this are the polling companies. Is there value in a polling company doing a survey and then telling Canadians that 60% of Canadians would throw anti-vaxxers in jail or something like that. Now, that's not real, but it's kind of along the line of the, you know, the, the results that we've had from the polling companies that really have tended to surface the, those darker thoughts that many of us have. Your thoughts, Robin? Well, no, it's not helpful, uh, Kim, but as we were chatting the other day, my editor father used to say, good news, never sold a single goddamn newspaper. <laughs> well, the, the same is true, I'm afraid, for polling. Pollsters need to gain attention, and sensational results get more attention than moderate results. So the temptation in the media and in the polling companies is always to torque the most sensational message. But I don't think this is one of those times. I wrote a column a few weeks before this one about the risk of damaging morale, apart from, from inciting bad behavior, it's just bloody depressing to listen to all of these doom statistics hour after hour flooding over us in every media. Why do we have to do that? I mean, you can say, turn off the television, don't listen to the radio, whatever, but why does the media not understand that they could probably sell a few newspapers or win a few eyeballs by stories of triumph, stories of overcoming, stories of success, rather than how many ICU beds are, you know, full of people who are dying. So I, I think there's a tension there which the media does have some responsibility to behave a little bit uh, more moderately, I guess, in tone and, and what they give priority to. If, Tasha, if any can, reflections? Yeah, go yeah ahead. I, I agree and I disagree. Um, I think I've seen some articles about good news stories. I recently saw one in Edmonton about a, a, a jurisdiction, um, I guess it was a riding or a ward, I'm not sure what the boundaries were, but they got a 99% uptake in vaccines because of local efforts mm -hmm. that they did in different languages to communicate with a diverse community. Um, I've seen some, you know, positive stories like that, but I agree there are fewer than the negative. That said, um, you know, the, the current wave that we're in, for example, um, we knew the negative here in Ontario anyway, um, in mid-December, the government knew it in mid-December. There was, it was a question of doom saying it was, you know, the tables of the, the science table and their predictions and there they were. And there was a report put out and media reported it and the government kind of didn't act on it the way that I thought they should have. But the point is some facts you just can't sugarcoat. I agree with polling, though. I do think that, you know, um, when you report stuff, and I can't remember the percentage of people said they'd want jail time for anti-vaxxers, but there was a significant percentage, and two-thirds think there should be, um, you know, the continued mandates against uh, anti-vaxxers um, anti or people who aren't vaccinated. It, it, there's, I think, it, um, a heightened sense that people are angry, and pollsters will try and measure what they think is out there. That said, when you see a statistic like that, of course, it takes you aback. But don't forget, before the pandemic, we had polls on things like, you know, are Canadians racist and other things that come out that are really unpleasant to read. So I'm kind of of two minds. I mean, I, I don't think the media has necessarily sensationalized things. I think that people, though, do tune out when that's all they hear. So report the stuff, but maybe balance it with some other news about other things, if it's possible. <laughs> like the Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, you think Ukraine. There it's getting it all around yeah exactly <laughs> uh let's dig in a little bit more to the anger side of this uh and uh, before we're finished i'm going to test fly some thoughts that i've had about maybe how we could have approached this differently and it's probably too late but uh, you never know um in in the emails that i get there's obviously there's there's a faction that distrusts government doesn't matter which government which flavor it is uh and they distrust science but there's also, a, I think, a, a fairly strong uh, streak of uh, personal sovereignty versus giving something up for the common good. And that's, that's a tough one to, to, to crack because if somebody says, look, nobody is going to tell me what I need to stick into my body, 
Um, you know, they don't have to be afraid of vaccines. They don't have to be anti-government, but uh, it does, let's face it, let's use the word offend, their sense of control over themselves. Um, so there's, there's the personal sovereignty thing. There's I don't like government thing. There's fear of needles and vaccines, et cetera. Is there anything else? Are we missing something else? I think those are pretty much the reasons that I've seen. In fact, I've seen it's, it's roughly half um, of people who choose not to be vaccinated are because of the sort of freedom and anti-government, don't tell me what to do kind of piece. And another significant chunk are the, I don't trust the science or I don't want to you know, put something in my body that I think is unsafe or unproven. And I think the second argument to me is something that I could understand to a certain point um, you know, when the vaccine is intro first introduced, for example, but we've had it now for over a year. Um, and I think, you know, side effects are known, they are minimal, they are the same, if not smaller percentage than vaccines, traditional vaccines all have had side effects in the past too. So to me, the second argument is no longer something that really holds a lot of water. The first one, though, is a really hard thing to combat, because if you're, if you believe that, you know, government should never tell you what to do, that's a much larger debate than just about vaccines. And I think that's what's the, the politicization piece I alluded to earlier, that that is something I think we have to grapple with because, you know, where does our, where do rights and responsibilities balance out? You know, how do we, how do we as a society, um, you know, validate people's rights, but then say, you have no responsibility to your fellow citizen, as Robin said, to, to do the right thing for your neighbor or others to get us out of this. You've got 10% of the population that essentially use the use a, a, a conservative word or be free riders because they have benefited from the 90 percent who had the vaccine if they hadn't the 90 percent hadn't had it i mean our hospitals would i don't even think they'd still be standing you know based on the numbers that have gone in of people who got sick um and a lot of vaccinated people got sick but it's because there are more vaccinated people so the numbers would have been even higher if everyone had been unvaccinated so it's a question of, of benefit and you know and duty and that's been missing in this whole conversation. So I don't know how you get to the people who say that, you know, government is, is the enemy um, in all cases. That, that's something I think is a longer term question we've got to really examine. Well, you made the uh, argument of uh, freedom and accountability uh, and, and that kind of uh, melds in here. Robin, I think one of, the, I, I was looking for some historical example of this current situation and uh, it came to me when I was uh, chatting with, with my wife, by the way, who's from Brazil and who follows what uh, Bolsonaro has been up to down there. That's another story. But we were saying that um, when was the last time you were able to go into a store, Home Sense, Canadian Tire, doesn't matter, and buy an ashtray? I think the only place you can find them now are the secondhand stores and, 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 the, uh, and the antique shops. Uh, and, and so the whole narrative around smoking, which I remember taking place, uh, you know, certainly it was a very public issue. I remember airlines trying non-smoking sections of the airplane as one way of dealing with this. But um, smoking, I think, is, is about as close an analogy as, as we have to what we're dealing with right now. Uh, and I'm wondering that if we had had social media back in that day, if we would have experienced exactly the same as we're experiencing now. Well, I take a, a more critical view of government's responsibility here again. Um, you know, it's like labor management disputes. There is a temptation in a very strike ridden environment to say, oh, this goddamn work is that stupid union. Uh, why are they doing this all the time? They're only going to hurt themselves. No, most bad labor situations are a function of bad management. Lots of statistical evidence of this over many jurisdictions, many years. We won the battle on smoking and we won the battle on wearing a seatbelt because governments fought hard to win the trust and be persuasive to their citizens about the risk to themselves and the risk to the community if they did something different. So there are possibilities, governments, did know how, if they've somewhat forgotten perhaps now, how to win a difficult policy debate with a hesitant or even recalcitrant citizenry. In this case, I think everybody in government needs to look themselves in the mirror and say, how much of this anger and civil unrest potentially do I own? What could I have done differently? How could we have communicated more effectively? So I, I'm 
I'm not so sympathetic to the view that, you know, because people are defining their se themselves in terms of personal sovereignty and I'm a libertarian or you can't tell me what to do, that that's come out of the blue or because they're crazy, because it's not actually something they really believe about everything. They do wear a seatbelt. Most of them have quit smoking. It's because they feel angry about how they have been treated by government. The government has been bossy and coercive and disrespectful. And so a certain chunk of the electorate, and I'm sad to say that the polls demonstrate it is highly overrepresented by one demographic cohort, young white men. Uh, they are the most virulent anti-vaxxers, uh, independents, you know, rah-rah uh, of, of any group in, in every community. But even for as disputatious a group as men between 18 and 24 uh, are always, um, there's a responsibility on the part of government to figure out a way to speak to them. I was fascinated all the way through the pandemic, for example, how few governments ever used trusted, non-political, non-bureaucratic spokespersons. Imagine the impact on a young, angry, post-adolescent man to have Wayne Gretzky speak to him directly and look him in the eye and say, you know, when I was your age, I felt that way, but this is something we've all got to do together, brother. Or a singer or um, a religious figure. I mean, there are all kinds of people in the community who could have been good at building social solidarity, but we didn't do that. And so now we're on our back foot and we have to figure out how to get back to normal again. I have to jump in for a sec, um, just because uh, while I see the logic you're going to, Robin, the, the tactics used by governments dealing with smoking and with seatbelts are the same they're using now. Taxes um, and restrictions, fines, it, they used a lot of sticks not just um, you know explanatory language or whatever. No, they, I, they got people on board because they didn't wanna have to pay for it or it just got too expensive in the case of smoking in particular. Um, you know, so I, I think that in fact, the analogy and that's what I made in my piece is that this is the same movie we've seen before. The difference is though, the consequences of the pandemic are so much more immediate, severe, and I guess universal than the consequences of smoking in particular and, and seat belts as well. Um, you know, not everyone's in an automobile accident. Not everyone has a family member who smokes and then gets sick and what, um, but everyone's in the pandemic. So everyone's been in this heightened environment. So suffering and stuck for two years. So I think that's why you see this virulence because there were debates over seat belts and smoking and, you know, a lot of freedom focused debate, but people didn't get you know, they didn't take trucks to the hill kind of thing. That's, you didn't see that. So I think if anything, governments failed is to appreciate um, just how severe this situation is. They deployed the same tactics, to your point, but they didn't measure the public mood quite as well. Yeah, and I think we have to be careful about the comparison because remember the smoking battle was a two decade battle. Correct, yes. And, and the, the, the seatbelt battle was almost as long. And, and we've had only, what, less than two years in, in this particular situation. And I think that's a positive indicator, maybe to try it on a more upbeat note, is that five years from now, I expect pretty much everybody will look back on this and say, you didn't want to get vaccinated? What were you thinking? You know, that there'll be a recognition that there was overreaction on both sides. Governments were too coercive and disrespectful. Some people were too dismissive of their obligations to their community. But I think being Canadians will probably settle down somewhere at some point in time and say, yeah, you know, we should have done that a little bit more thoughtfully on all sides. I hope we're just not talking about it anymore in five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to test fly something with you guys. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at these two headlines. What is to be done with our vaccine delinquents and the unvaccinated must be deterred from harming others. And uh, in, in corporate communication, I, I had my day in media, uh, but I also went to the dark side in corporate communication for a long time before doing this, which is the darkest of dark sides, of course. Um, <laughs> and I discovered a long time ago that if you really want to change somebody's attitude and behavior, you don't get off on the right foot when you make them wrong about where they are. People, when you tell them they're wrong and they're not good, uh, they're, they're bad, uh, they dig in. They, you know, and it's a, it's a natural human reaction. And so, you know, and I was not addressing that's, where, that's where I would have started. 
you know, don't have the don't have people thinking that they have to defend their their choices. And when the anti-vaxxers are there, what do they do? They defend their choice and they defend it by using every Tom, Dick and Harry that's got, uh, you know, uh, an idea, theory, uh, a conspiracy, whatever, that uh, justifies them taking the position that they have. So it's kind of a leap of faith, but maybe what we do is we accept their choice. Okay, you don't want to be vaccinated. Our primary goal is to keep you safe. Because when you're safe, everybody's safe. And how do we do that? Well, we, we, we kind of keep you out of risky situations. And then you find a way to kind of repurpose new coat of paint on things like vaccines or like masks or like social distancing or, you know, just got to keep you out of big crowds because that's where you as an unvaccinated person have the best chance of getting sick. And if you're going to get sick, you've got the best chance of being really sick and dying. And we don't want that. What do you think? It's a nice idea. I just think, I do think knowing a lot of the people who would have the reaction as government's telling what to do, will say the same thing. You're being paternalistic, Ken. You're telling me what's good for me. And I know better than you. I'm not unsafe when I go to the store without a mask. I'm not unsafe. COVID's not real. Uh, I mean, I could tell you the kind of mail I got. Robert Kennedy is like a god to some of these folks. And how do you argue with that? You know, I, I know personally of people who've made the most strange choices, very rational people who you would never think would make such choices in their lives, but have chosen to accept these kinds of theories. I'm not saying everyone who doesn't have a vaccine is in this boat, but stuff that you just, I shake my head. And I think it's partly a reaction because this is such an intense situation. And because it's an intense situation, governments don't have much of a choice in some ways to say, okay, folks, we're gonna accommodate you. Because here's the thing, if you accommodate people who choose not to take the vaccine, or you take a softer approach, well, then why should any of us get it, right? Why, why should I go and get my booster? Why should, I, why should it matter? If it doesn't matter, I can still go and, and go to the store and do this or do that. Like, it, it discourages people who've made the right choice and it invalidates their choice. And that's the problem too, is that the message you send, this isn't over, sadly. You know, we need boosters every year for what? Maybe, I hope not, but... If you, if you give people who choose not to do that the same status or acceptance or whatnot as people who have, then you're implicitly saying, well, it doesn't matter. And mm. I think people still need to think it matters. And I, I hate to say that, but it does matter. Robin, have you, uh, in, in Tasha's uh, second article, she uh, presented three truths. Have you had a chance to look at those? Do you think she's uh, hit the nail on the head? Just in terms of basically how, what the sort of things we should be thinking about as we go forward. Remind me what they were. I'm sorry, I read it, but I forgot. <laughs> well, truth number one, everybody gets sick at the same time. Hospital systems will likely break down. Life-saving surgeries are canceled. Um, there was, I think in your article, Robin, you mentioned uh, a study that said Canada's experienced 12,000 deaths of people of waiting on waiting lists in, in uh, 2020 or 2021. Um, the second truth is that uh, we hope that uh, the Omicron is the last variant, but it might not be. And the third, if more people had not been vaccinated when Omicron hit, things would be far worse now. Um, so that goes back to Tash's comment about, if you like, the free riders out there. Um, anything else? Any other truths that uh, kind of spring to mind following those? I think, Ken, that your point about not insulting those you're trying to persuade to take a different point of view is perfectly sound. I would say, in my case, that column was addressed to policymakers as much as ordinary citizens. I wanted to impress upon people like the Premier of Quebec the danger of going down the path that they were intending to go down. But I think another truth is that you can be as engaging, inclusive, gentle in your mention of what is expected of someone in terms of an absolute necessity for the safety of the community. But at some point, Tash is right. You have to say, and here are the consequences if you don't, because there, there, there's a line that you cannot cross. You know, the line that, I mean, let me speak very personally about this. I've lost three friends during the pandemic. Each of them were people with severe mental condition, medical conditions, who could not get the service they needed because of COVID. And they died as a result of that. Um, so 
I'm not very patient about hospital beds being occupied by people who were too selfish to get vaccinated at the expense of people who are dying, not from COVID, but other diseases because there's nowhere for them to go. And I think that's the line that we all have to keep in mind here. You can indulge and you can be you know, tolerant of people's claims about why they don't want to get vaccinated, but there's a huge real community cost to their selfishness. And at some point, I think you have to say, gently perhaps at first, um, no, you're never gonna go to a hockey game again. No, you cannot go to a movie. No, you may not go to Walmart. Um, and if those are choices you wanna make for your life, potentially, you're free to make them. But those are the consequences of that decision. Tasha, we'll give you the last word. Is that kind of the uh, freedom versus accountability argument? Well, I think it, it does it does boil down to this this balancing, like I said, to rights and responsibilities. And I think if any ambassadors, you know, to talk about Gretzky or, or artists or whatever, to me it's healthcare workers too. And that is the big selfish piece too. I mean, these people are getting burned out. They are giving their lives. Many of them got sick themselves, some died, mm -hmm. taking care of people. And I mean, do we just expect that? We expect that that's fine, that's okay. I mean, as a society, how callous are we? We go to a hospital, we expect to get care. Well, then we have an obligation to those people who are giving that care. And right now are in a state of crisis continually to keep them safe too and to minimize the whole situation so that, you know, they aren't uh, getting sick, dying, burning out, leaving the profession. I mean, and to be completely selfish about it, you don't want all the doctors and nurses to leave because then who's going to take care of you? So we should be interested in that too, in protecting not the system, but the people who make up that system. Well said, Tasha. Listen, this has been great and I could go on and on, but I know you guys have things that you need to do. We didn't even get into the bioethics issue here and the triaging that uh, some doctors are talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll just blue sky, it would be nice to have another conversation about that, but uh, I think uh, I, I really appreciate the time that you've spent on, on this one. Uh, and I think that the people who, uh, you know, managed to watch this conversation, you know, might, might be given something to think about. I, I guess, you know, last, last, last words, what should people be thinking about as we go forward? Robin? I think I cast my mind to the future on a horizon which is a happier day when we finally got to the, if not the end, the end of the worst part of what we've been through and not to allow the drear of midwinter and the statistics to drag you down too much. You keep your eyes on a possible happier future. I'm looking forward to visiting my new granddaughter in Hong Kong. <laughs> um, and I, that keeps me happy just thinking about that prospect down the road. Tasha? Yeah, I would say actually to be grateful for what we have to be able to combat this pandemic. Uh, if we were in 1918, we wouldn't have vaccines and we wouldn't have the antivirals and we wouldn't have the internet to even be able to talk to each other. We are very lucky. It sounds strange to say that we are lucky to have the tools as a society that we do to fight this thing. So we should be thankful that we are at this point faced with this challenge and to Robin's point, be optimistic because we will overcome it. I am confident. Well, and I'll add that I think we need to be thankful that uh, you know we have uh, we have journalists in the country who are prepared to turn this over and look at the greasy side and the shiny side and both sides and the front and the back. You know, it's uh, it is an important working through process that uh, is, is not perfect, and uh, you know there are going to be times when we make people upset or times we give people hope. Uh, I, I like the notion that uh, maybe we shift gears now and we, we look to hope a little bit more. You know, the, if uh, this variant is kind of the pandemic's last gasp before it becomes endemic, that would be great. Uh, many more things to think about in that regard. For now, I'll thank you both for taking part in this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Tash. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Robin.
Uh, there you go. It's um, that was a long, long, long chat, and uh, that was kind of a test to see uh, if uh, <laughs> if we burned out our attention span to the point where you know anything more than thirty seconds is uh, is is an eternity. But uh, it was interesting to hear the two of them talk because they were working through some stuff. You could see how their own thinking on the issue kind of progressed as they went along. But they did end up, you know, highly critical of the people who choose not to be vaccinated um, for a variety of reasons. So I don't, I don't know that we solved or settled anything, but it, it's interesting to listen to two people whose job it is to turn things over in their mind and present them to us in hopefully a digestible way. Um, by the way, Robin Sears has a rich history with the New Democratic Party. I think it was his uh, great-grandfather on his mother's side helped to uh, found the uh, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF, which was the uh, forerunner to the NDP. Uh, Robin also, I think, uh, does some work with um, the Broadbent Institute, and of course he writes for the Toronto Star. Um, Tasha Carradine is a public affairs uh, consultant. She's a principal with Navigator Limited. And I remember some folks from Navigator working in British Columbia in the past. Uh, she's a strategic advisory and communications uh, person who too has a, a rich history on the conservative side of the political spectrum. And of course, she's the political commentator for Post Media.